<laughs> well, anyway, what we've got today is our speaker, and he's sitting over there. He's 91 years old. He flew a B-17 on night missions. He flew threw out pamphlets, I, I guess. Sometimes they'd get him in the uh, in the light. And he turned. He said his navigator always got him back. Can you imagine that? Because you never did that. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the time, I have to call you and tell the meeting's on. Yeah, that's right. And where to go? I'll tell you where to go right now. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Robert Campbell to the floor. He flew alone, night missions, 10 guys on the B-70s, so he had a full crew, and the rest of the story is this. Is that I'm 91 years old, and that was uh, that was 68 years ago that I was a cadet in the Army Air Force. Uh, at that time, I was uh, taller than I am now. Wasn't as big around in the middle, and there was a lot of mic close to your mouth. Touch your chin with the mic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was a lot, lot better looking than 68 years ago. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I graduated from cadets in uh, December of 19, 1943. And uh, at that time, I was in absolute top physical condition. Okay, I could run like a deer and, and jump and all that stuff. But then in February and March of 44, after I was a second lieutenant and uh, had my, my wings, I was in uh, B-17F. Uh, training in Dalhart, Texas. Has anybody been to Dalhart, Texas? You know where that is? It's up in northwest Texas. And it's a, not the greatest place in the world to live. Uh, one day we had a, a, a dust storm, a rainstorm, and a snowstorm on the same day. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, at that time I was to be co pilot on this airplane. Uh, we were to get our crew together. Uh, the pilot, the chief pilot, uh, he was uh, a little different. He, 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 he was he wasn't worth the damn as a, an administrator. So I said, uh, uh, "Would you like me to do the administrator work?" He was tickled to death. So I, I did all the administration for the crew, and uh, this guy. The, the chief pilot, he was a good pilot, but he, he, was, he was kind of a loner. Uh, and then we had a, of the crew we made up, uh, we had a guy named Johnny Townsend, was our navigator, and uh, he was a real bright guy, and uh, he and I became very good friends, and we were roommates over in, uh, over in England when we were up there. Uh, it, Enlisted men we had uh, were great. We had trouble, or I had trouble with one of the boys I was worried about. He was uh, our left waist gunner, and uh, he would get airsick uh, on his on his training missions. I said, if you're going to be airsick, I got to take you off and get a replacement. But he begged me. He said, I, I think I can make it the next two times. No, I'll get over it. I promised him I would if he got over his sickness, and he did. But I always kind of worried about him because I thought he might be the nervous type. But anyway, then on uh, April 44, we were went to uh, uh, Kearney, Nebraska, and picked up a brand new uh, B-17G. And they, they, were, they would make them in the factories in like Seattle, and then they'd fly them to uh, Place like Kearney, Nebraska, and then modify them. And then we found out when we flew them over to, to uh, Glasgow, Scotland, they modified them again. Uh, anyway, then we were to fly this airplane over to uh, Glasgow, Scotland, and we went by the way of uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, Cold Bay, Labrador, and Iceland, and then finally to Scotland. Has anybody been in Cold Bay, Labrador? 
None of you have been there. Okay, you haven't missed much. Uh, I had a rude awakening. I was in the chow line, and I was really hungry. And uh, gosh, the food looked good. Uh, mashed potatoes looked so great. They had nice green-looking peas. And everything was good, and I was hungry, so I said, "Pat her on." So they, I got this big plate of food. I can't remember what kind of meat it was, but uh, I sat down, and I'll tell you, it was just like a bunch of chalk. It was dehydrated food, and at that time they didn't know how to make dehydrated food. And those poor guys that were based up there, they had to eat that every day. Uh, on our way over, we didn't have too much trouble except uh, in uh, Iceland, uh, the weather was bad, and we had to make an instrument landing. And it broke out of the clouds about 500 feet over the water. And they had a lot of Icelandic fishing boats there. And uh, I think we had a lot of mad Icelanders at us because we were rocking the boats. <laughs> and then on the way from uh, the next day, we stayed overnight at uh, Iceland. And then the next day, we flew to uh, Scotland. And the Germans, what they did, well, first of all, from Glasgow, Scotland, they had a beam you could follow. And, and I don't know if any of you guys are, well, you're pretty old. You knew what the, those, uh, how you follow the beam into the airport. And, uh, but the Germans had a, another radio station in Norway, and it was very similar, just parallel to this beam. And they would try to get you to follow their beam, and you would either run out of fuel over the north, uh, before you got to Norway or get into Norway. But uh, we had a good navigator and we were not we were pretty sharp and aware of that, so that didn't bother us. So when we got to Glasgow, they took away our nice airplane and, uh, because they were going to modify it. And then they put us on a train and sent us down to a base, a small base near uh, Luton, England, which is uh, a little bit northeast of London. And uh, we didn't know what was really going on, but we found out that it was a, uh, uh, we weren't going to be flying in, in formation in these big groups that dropping bombs, but it was, uh, we were to drop leaflets at night in a, a bomb they called it, uh, the uh, Monroe bomb with a kind of a cardboard cylinder about this big around and uh, about not quite as long as your table here and uh, stuffed with leaflets and then they had a detonating deal at the end of it so when it got down to about a thousand feet it would split this cardboard cylinder open and the leaflets would be scattered but uh, and we wouldn't have any, we'd be flying all by ourselves alone, no night fighter, no fighter uh, protection at all. So the, our protection was darkness and uh, to fly as high as you could. So we usually on our missions we were up at uh, very close to 30,000 feet. And uh, the flak not not very much of it would get up that high, so we were pretty protected away from the flag. And but they were trying to get us in night fighters and to get us in searchlights and uh, to show the night fighters where we were. And as soon as I got out of the searchlight, I changed direction and and helped a little bit so that they couldn't find us. And I had, we lucked out. No night fighters caught us. Uh, we were. In what they call the, uh, it was the eight, we were the 406 Bomb Squadron, which was part of the uh, American Military Intelligence Department, known as the Office of Strategic Services or the OSS. And they had another uh, group in there too called the uh, uh, Carpetbaggers. And they, they were, uh, Carpetbaggers flew. B-24s, and they were dropping supplies into the uh, some of the resistance in this occupied country. 
they, they, that was a different squadron than we were in. Um, our base was real small, and our commanding officer was a lieutenant colonel, and we had one chaplain at the base, and he had to handle everything for all faiths, whether you're Jewish, Catholic, or Protestant, or I don't think we had any Muslims at that time. Uh, and we were a very informal group, but we weren't very, very military-like. Uh, it was a little bit like the MASH group that you see on TV. We were training uh, for night missions on the first two weeks we were there, and our navigator was training on a, what we call a, Bri a British G navigation system. Uh, anybody acquainted with a British G? There you are. Anyway, it was a scope, but so on. And I, as I understand it, they, they, they uh, tuned in on three different radios and where the cross was, where he figured out where he worked. And our navigator was, he was excellent. He could, he could take those, uh, figure out where we were all the time. And, and uh, the Germans would try to screw him up and false signals and stuff, but he, he could tell them false signals from the, uh, the right signal. But anyway, during this time we were training, they borrowed our ball turret gunner. He was a ball turret gunner. He was the oldest guy on our crew. We called him Pappy. And so he was on a different crew for his first mission, and he got killed. And I'll tell you, the, the uh, morale of my group went down like a, well, like the stock market did the other day. <laughs> I'll say the crew was, they thought, oh my God, I mean, you get killed on your first mission. But uh, then I, our first mission was flown on May 28th of 44, which was nine days before the Normandy invasion. And then our second and third missions were on June 7th and 8th, the nights right after the invasion. And on those two missions, we were dropping leaflets and uh, Holland and Belgium to let the folks there that were uh, in that territory know about the invasion because that boosted up their morale and then they uh, uh, raised the war king with the uh, Germans that were in their territory. Uh, I'll have to tell you a little bit about how we formed a mission in the uh, early afternoon of the, of the night we were going to go in the early afternoon they'd call our navigator down to headquarters and he'd be briefed as where we were going to go that night and uh, then he would lay out all those plans uh, for navigating to that, uh, those destinations. Sometimes we drop leaflets in maybe two or three different places at the same uh, on the same run. Uh, but he was sworn to secrecy and he couldn't tell anybody where we were going to go. I was his roommate and of course I knew better than to try to ask him. Uh, then about after an early dinner, uh, the whole crew was called down to uh, headquarters and we were briefed uh, on the mission. And they told us about the weather, where we might get into trouble with flak and night fighters searchlights and uh, that so we know all about it what we put it and then uh, after our briefing uh, the chaplain would have a little service for each of us as of the different faiths and then we get into our uh, well we were allowed to take we, we all was carrying a, a, a escape kit uh, it, was a picture of us in civilian clothes and all that stuff. So that if you did parachute out and got down, if you got to meet the underground, they could make up false papers for you so you could try to escape and get back uh, usually through Spain. Unfortunately, I didn't have to fail out. Uh, the uh, we 
with Jen and get into the, oh, another thing we could do is we had, we had uh, 45 um, caliber pistols, and we could carry them, but I chose not to because I figured if I'm coming down a parachute with a pistol on my hip, uh, I'm not going to be able to shoot my way out, and, and if they find me with a pistol, they're going to kill me. So I chose never to carry a pistol with me. Uh, we would then get into our Jeep, and our airplane was in the far side of the field. Airplanes were not parked in a row where you had to, they were all separated because uh, if the Germans came over, they, they could they had them on the roll like they did at Pearl Harbor, and it, it had a duck, like shoot a bunch of ducks in a row. Uh, Anyway, when we got out there, then the, the top turret gunner, who was also the maintenance guy on the, on the crew, he and I would inspect the airplane, and we get some some of the crew members to pull the props through. And, uh, we pull the props through to be sure there's no uh, oil to, to plug up a cylinder, and then. Uh, Radio operator, the ball turret gunner, the two waist gunners, and the, and the uh, tail gunner would get in to the airplane on the right side of the back, was a, was a door. And then the uh, chief pilot and the navigator would get on the airplane and through this door that's under the uh, pilot's seat. And you'd have to reach up. And we were young and strong, and we just swing right up there and into the airplane. I, there's no way I could do that today. I don't think I could even reach up as high as that. And then, uh, uh, after we finished our inspection, the uh, top turret gunner and I would get in the airplane, and I'd be up in my cockpit uh, uh, chair, the co pilot's seat on the right, and then I'd hear the uh, Navigator say, you damn big klutz, what in the hell? You, you broke all the pencils on my table and it was the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, bombardier, he was kind of an awkward guy. He was the last guy to get in. He, he's crawling in and mess up this table for the navigator. So then I'd get on the intercom and I'd say, okay, be sure all the hatches are closed and we're ready to go. That was the routine. Another thing was, there's little strange things, uh, each of us have personal things. Uh, I had a, a crew chief get a piece of three-inch armor plate, cut it out, and put it on the seat of my seat, because I didn't want flak to be hit me in the tail end. And then uh, I learned that after my first, I used to wear two pairs of socks from Mission uh, uh, old white underwear and then an OD colored uh, wool longer pair that went up half up on my day. And after the first five missions I thought gee, I should wash these outer socks. And I thought, no, this we didn't have any trouble, maybe I'd better not wash them. So I wore the same sock, outer pair of socks for all forty nine of the missions without washing. <laughs> I didn't dare wash. Another little thing I used to do is, when we were coming back and letting down, when we got to 17, after you wear this oxygen mask up there, and uh, you get moisture in your breath, and then your whiskers coming out, and it gets kind of irritating on your face. So when we were letting down at 7, I don't know why I picked 17,000 feet, but when I got 17,000 feet, I took off my oxygen mask. And I smoked at that time, and I put a cigarette in my mouth and tried to light a match. That match would hardly burn because there wasn't enough oxygen in the air, but that's, that was the routine I used to take. I've got a list of different things that happened on some of the missions. 
on the uh, first four missions went just fine. Then on the fifth mission, one of our engines went out. And uh, we had all kinds of electrical problems also. Then on the 11th mission, it was a, a real rough one. And uh, they got us in the searchlights many times and night fighters were trying to get us. But uh, I, I would, uh, as soon as the searchlight went out, I changed direction and uh, altitude a little bit because I didn't want the fighters to know us where, where we were. And then uh, on the uh, 11th to 23rd mission, our home field was all fogged in. We had to stay at, overnight in northern England. And we wouldn't know that our uh, field was fogged in until we got right near the field because they didn't want to uh, broadcast it all over the uh, country. And then on our 24th mission, uh, that was the first time I had a daylight mission, and it was, it was uh, east of Normandy, of the, where they had the invasion. They had a bunch of Germans pocketed it. And our mission was to fly in there low this time and drop uh, surrender leaflets. And I'll tell you, I never saw so much flak in my life. We had flak was going through the wing and hitting us all over the place. <coughs> Fortunately, for some reason, it didn't hit the fuselage. And uh, but uh, we were okay on that one. We got home, but uh, I, I think both our people and, and the Germans were shooting at us that time. And then on our 26th mission, again, the home field was fogged in and we had to land in Wales. And the 27th mission was another daylight mission over Normandy, dropping surrender leaflets. And this time, we did have a, a big uh, hit on the fuselage. It was really a big whopping bang. And, when you're flying, I, mean, you, you, I could tell the fuselage in the back end was swinging. And uh, so I was afraid of somebody's hit. So the first thing I'd do was uh, on the control pedestal, there was a button that I press, and I'd say, coup, coup, call. And everybody would report in and start, uh, uh, start out with bombardier okay, navigator okay, top turret gunner okay, and go all through. So everybody reporting okay. So then I pressed it again, I said, where, where do we get hit? So this kid that I was worried about that used to get airsick and I thought he was nervous, came back and he said, sir, he says, there's a hole about two feet from my head, just on the left side, about the size of a basketball. And he was as calm as could be, and I thought, oh my God, this kid is okay. <laughs> so, uh, Then we, I, on the 29th mission, uh, I was made up of a special crew that they made up, and I was co-pilot on that one, and we went to uh, Norway, and uh, we were dropping, uh, it was like newspapers we were dropping, telling them what was going on in, uh, in, uh, in the Normandy uh, invasion and I'm trying to encourage the Norwegians to be raised and came with the Germans or whatever, so that the Germans would produce uh, troops from Norway to send them to France. And then uh, when we came back, our home field was fogged in and we had to go up to Scotland. And oh God, that was a ten, nine hours and ten minute flight. And I was so damn tired. So I was looking forward to a good night's sleep. And we, but when we landed there, I think the whole British Air Force was there. We went into, into the one room and here the guys were laying on the pool tables on the floor all over the place. And we had no place to sleep, so we had to go back in our airplane and cover up with flak suits to get a rest. Uh, on the 31st, 35th mission, they had a lot of night flyer fighters trying to get us, but we were okay. 
30 information the tachometer instrument went out we had lots of flag 39th mission I uh, oh that was uh, 39th mission I had to take a new crew that was just came over from the United from the States I hated those missions because uh, I was the only one that had any experience flying big, uh, missions and and we, we got up in the air and flying and climbing and then I got a uh, message that the ball turret gunner had forgotten his special wrench to get into the ball turret. So I said, well, I'm sorry we can't go back because if we go back we'll lose our protection for the darkness. And uh, so we just continued going and I said, well, the ball, the ball turret gunner, you sit in the radio room and hook up your oxygen mask there and, and you just make a lot of prayers that we don't get hit from a fighter. And then on the uh, 40th mission, we run into a lot of thunderstorms and we had to cut the mission short. 41st mission, we had a bad weather again and lots of thunderstorms. The 42nd mission, we had many drops over France that night and uh, <coughs> When we were over Paris, a P-61 night fighter of our own picked us up and he was ready to shoot us down, but then he recognized that we were friendly folks. But I had ordered the crew, I said, if he started shooting us, we started shooting at him, but we didn't have to do that. Uh, then on the 43rd missions, it was ended a lot of searchlights and night fighters trying to get us. 41st, 44th mission, there was a new crew again. And, and we had many drops leave us that night. 45th mission, I, something happened to my oxygen line. And, uh, I don't know, it got tangled up somehow and I, I passed out. But the pilot got me back in my seat, straightened up and got the oxygen mask opened up so that I was okay. And I'll tell you, you know, that's a strange, if, if you wanted to die, that's the easy way to do it. I, I, it was painless. But uh, I was, and, and I didn't have any bad after effects. The 46th mission, I had a new crew again from the States. So that was my third one and last one, thank you. And then the, on the 49th mission was my last mission, and I was, Glad of that. That was in late September of uh, 1944. Uh, but there were a lot of fun things that also happened on a cruise. Uh, on one flight, we were going along and everything was quiet. All I could hear is the uh, engine. Uh, what, what, what happened? Okay, but the, the top turret gunner's uh, microphone. Uh, line got caught in the trigger and the trigger and he shot off about 50 rounds and I thought we were going to be being attacked by night fighters so I shoved the control pedestal forward to put us into a dive and made a sharp uh, right turn and uh, then I when I straightened out I pushed this button for a coup ball everybody answered except the top turret gunner so the top turret gunner was just behind me, and I just, uh, his butt was just almost within, within easy reach. So I grabbed his butt and shook it. He waved kind of a signal to me that he was okay. Then when he got hooked up, he explained what happened. He said, and then, and then as you threw the airplane into a dive, and I fell down. So, so that's what happened now. So, uh, Here's another one. Uh, we, we were climbing up over England one night, and, uh, and then I got a call from the right waist gunner. He was in a bad way. He needed, he needed a bathroom. And I said, well, we don't have a bathroom, of course, you know. I, said, I suggest you use your flat helmet. And I said, 
when you through using your flak helmet, you let me know and I'll have the plumber here open the bomb bay doors and you can toss it out. That's exactly what we did, and I always wondered where that helmet was. <laughs> um, Another time was uh, we were all ready to go on a mission. We were out there to get in the airplane, and then they called the mission off. So I dismissed the crew. And then about an hour later, they called the mission back on. So we had to get to round up the crew members. And our, our radio operator was uh, head man of the uh, non-commissioned officers club. We was, we'd been drinking. And he was in no shape to be flying that night, and I couldn't get a replacement for him, so I had him sit down in the radio room and put the oxygen mask on him and just turn the oxygen on, and I was scolding him. And he, he was really on the ball that night. He, it sobered him up, and he was, he was a good guy. Uh, and then, I was only 24 years old here with all these guys reporting to me, and our right waist gunner, uh, came in one afternoon and he wanted my permission to marry his English girlfriend. And I knew this kid. Uh, his dad was a uh, doctor in New England and his older brother was in medical school. And he was from a good family. He was a nice kid. And I knew that also that there were English girls over there that were anxious to get to the U.S. and that was a way to get to the U.S. is to marry a GI and get back to get in the United States. So I wouldn't give permission to turn them down. And I think that made the right decision, right? But I always think about that. I was only 24 years old and making that decision. And then when we finished the mission, I got down, when we were being debriefed, they gave us two fresh eggs. That's the only time we got eggs. And then, he also had a little jigger of whiskey for each of us. Well, we had a, two of our my crew members were teetotalers and didn't drink. So I said, well, you guys pick up the drink anyway and set it on this table over the side. I said, my navigator and I will take care of it. So my navigator and I each had two drinks that after for every mission. Then our next place was to go to the uh, we fry our eggs in the kitchen. And so you, you see all these guys standing around in their, in their flight suits, flying eggs, frying eggs, uh, at about 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, if, if, if any of you remember what the petty, petty pictures were? These, these guys, petty, the petties, nice looking girls. Shut up, girl. Well, anyway, one day my navigator showed up and he, he had a pile of those pictures, two pairs of scissors, and two bottles of glue. I said, what in the hell are you doing? He said, well, we're going to cut these out and put a wall, put wallpaper on our place. So we, we spent a lot of time cutting out these pictures of good little girls and put glue on it and paste it on the wall. Uh, we owned, we had a, a radio was made in Holland there. And we each had a bicycle, each, my navigator and I. And then we had a Cocker Spaniel dog. I can't remember where we, where we got that on, the dog. But uh, we sold the radio and the two bikes to a new crew that came over when we were through. And a Cocker Spaniel we gave to the chaplain who was a good friend of ours. And, uh, and anyway, after I finished my missions, uh, oh, I got the other uh, one too. Uh, we were a pretty informal group. And uh, anyway, during this period, I got promoted to the first lieutenant, and uh, I was checked out as the first pilot. And uh, so I was flying the left seat. And, uh, uh, and then after my missions, I was. 
awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. So all of these guys were supposed to be a formal affair, and these guys were supposed to be standing at attention while I'm getting this um, Distinguished Flying Cross pinned on me, like the colonel. So anyway, they took a picture at that time, and one of the guys, he, he was just standing like this, blowing his nose at his, <laughs> He, he wasn't impressed at all. <laughs> it was really a formal group. But they kept me over there for a couple of months after my mission was done. I was uh, uh, doing making test hops on uh, B-17s that had been patched up. And uh, the first one I had trouble with, they had put new control cables in it. Or not new ones, but anyway, they re it. Anyway, when I got in there with my co-pilot, everything checked out. You know, we went checked the ailerons, the elevators, the rudder. Uh, everything checked out. So we started running, going down the runway, and God started. I saw that the rudder pedals were mushy, but I was going too fast to stop. So I had to get up in the air, and I had to make. And I could put my foot all the way down, and nothing happened on the rudder. So I had to make a turn with using the ailerons only. And when I got back and landed, okay, I started getting angry. And I, uh, so I called the crew, found out who the crew chief was, and I said, uh, I've been a new rule. I said, from now on, the crew chief goes with me. So I didn't have any troubles after that. And, uh, and after doing that for a while, then they had me flying some uh, British and American officers over to North, North Ireland, closing up uh, bases there that they used for training uh, lighter pilots. So I think that's about the whole story. We came back on the ship in late 1944. Do you have any questions? Yeah. You, you flew most of your missions at a high altitude, didn't you? Yes, all, all but two of them. Two of them were dropped in the, uh, the two, two daylight missions were low, but all the others, well, we get as high as we could. Yeah. I got a book on the carpetbaggers, and they flew their missions at treetop level. Yeah, I no, was wondering about the carpetbaggers because... no moon. Yeah, I, you know, and I didn't know anything about the carpetbaggers until I got back and found out about it. Well, I didn't know anything about the just reading stuff, but uh, it was a Eighth Air Force reunion in San Diego, yeah. and in the lobby they had carpetbaggers. My wife says, "What's a carpetbagger? How the hell? I don't know." <laughs> I said, "We'll find out when we go to the symposium." And it was like they, the carpetbaggers were telling their stories. Well, they they, yeah, they dropped uh, they, supplies for the underground, and they dropped uh, agents. Some agents, underground agents, through the a hole in the in the floor called a Joe hole, and then. Later, I understand the carpetbaggers, when they got deep inside and the Germans were getting sharp as to interrupt uh, stuff, uh, they used the uh, mosquito airplanes at high altitude and they were got the information from them by radio somehow and they fly back. Mm -hmm. That is to circle? Yeah. And it was just a, a, a narrow cone. Yeah. Of a, a, a yeah, there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on. That, Bob? Yes? Did you ever see any of the leaflets or do you have any that were dropped out? You know, I, I was too stupid. To, I should have. <laughs> I, I could have got one every time, but I, I never did. And it, I've got some good news from you. Yeah. Shortly after the war, the photographer on my base sent me a whole bunch of stuff, including a couple leaflets. Oh. And uh, I am translate. They're phenomenal. Yeah. On, June 6th, D-Day, they dropped one and said, here are the radio stations, New York, Radio Algiers, Radio Barry, don't tune into the Germans. And there, it shows the assault and, and so forth. Yeah. You may have dropped some. Yeah, well, uh, I was told, or I found out that if someone in the occupied territories was found with one of these leaflets, that was, they, they were a, a donor. I mean, the Nazis would just shoot them. And so, it, and so on. I guess it, some of the pickup leaf was at night in shoes or other places. Any other questions? Yes. When you came, <coughs> when you came back to England from a mission, 
Did you have some maneuvers to go through before I had you approach the council? What was that question again? Did you uh, have some maneuvers that you had to make when you came back from this? Oh, yeah, we had a special call on the radio to identify who we were. But we didn't, I don't remember any special maneuvers. Did they put the uh, spotlight on you? No, not, not that I remember. Yeah. I, I do remember, uh, this was not a mission, but it was uh, coming back from, uh, uh, well, we didn't, our, you know, we, we didn't have lights on our runway and all that stuff that uh, uh, they have on today. And uh, I was going back from Ireland and uh, it was pretty foggy that night, so I asked them to put some flares along the runway. Well, he's, uh, I guess they, some communication screwed up and they just put some flares at the end of the runway instead of along the side. So I came in and I was lined up uh, and I damn near hit the control tower. And anyway, I straightened out and then got up in the air and timed myself, you know, like 30 seconds and then make a left turn and so many seconds and all that stuff to come back the next time I made it. But, uh, it's, it's hairy. We didn't have much, we didn't have any ground to help. And, not, and I guess in some fields they even had a little trough along the runway where they could put gasoline in and light it if it was foggy. It was pretty hairy. Any other questions? Here. Yes. You had a career with Northwest Airlines afterwards? Yeah, I was, well, when I came back from the, uh, overseas, you're, you're kind of a nothing, you know. And uh, so I was just ferrying some war weary airplanes out to the desert in Arizona. Now, uh, this isn't what I really want to do. So I went to a special school in the uh, instrument flying and they came in, in, uh, so I qualified as an instrument flying instructor. And then I got into the base at uh, Long Beach and I was teaching instrument flying on the C-47s. So I was first officer on the C-47, I had a lot of hours teaching instrument flying. So when, when the war was ended, uh, I went to Northwest Airlines, I was gonna be a big pilot, so, so uh, I'm uh, filling out my application and uh, a former instructor of mine that recognized me there and said, for me that they weren't hiring pilots. So I said, well, I'm almost done filling out the application, I'll finish. And I was, went back to Minneapolis at the Andrews Hotel. When I got there, there was a message to call Northwest Airlines. Uh, and uh, he had picked up my application and uh, he saw that I had accounting in college. I had a degree in accounting. And uh, so he took it to the vice president and uh, this vice president said, we, we, we want a guy like that to know something about airplanes because nobody in the county knows anything about airplanes. So that's how I started. <laughs> so uh, I, I was in, became chief cost accountant and then I uh, became a head of financial planning and worked myself up. I was, so I was a vice president for the last 20 years. I was Any other questions? You know, I'll tell you, I, I didn't know anything about this outfit until Glenn Goodell told me about it uh, all about a month or so ago. And I never did belong to the uh, American Legion or the BLW. And the reason I did belong to the American Legion, I was invited there. They poured the damn many drinks into me that first night, and I had such a hangover. But, uh, I don't want to join an outfit like this. So I never did join an outfit, but this is a great outfit, and I'm so surprised that you have this big turnout every every week. It's unbelievable. So. We want you back. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this, 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 I'm going to give you a few stories about instrument flying about some of my students that had some fun with that too. Interesting story.
Thanks, Bob. Come, come back again. Yes. I can play. Oh.